Hello and welcome to a presentation about Salesforce and GIS integration with geoprocessing workflows by Accenture and MBS. Hello, my name is Lee Pepper and I'm a map nerd. I love maps. And sometimes with my job as a solutions architect at Managed Business Solutions, I get to build things with maps. And this is one of those occasions. We got to work together with some awesome partners to be able to build an excellent map solution. Not only Salesforce, but we can integrate with any context of integration. So when I say that, any system that can provide a specific ID for context can be integrated to the context ID in ArcGIS Online or Enterprise Services, giving us a decoupled environment to utilize all of the Esri and open source tools that we may need. Let's talk about external user input. Many of the systems need users to create geospatial data. How do we get every user to be able to create geospatial data that is accurate with no GIS background. We use point data from handheld GPS units or official documents, but that gets tedious and expensive. So geocoders, let's talk about geocoders. Geocoders let us accomplish a lot of this. So let's talk about guided text input and geocoders and how we did that in this system. Let's talk about what geocoders there are. We have a geocoder for addresses. Everybody knows about this one. I won't talk too much about it, but needless to say, you type in an address and you get a point. Now, one thing I'd like to just emphasize is, is that we must suggest, not just take them at their word, we must suggest what their data must be. So we want to make clean data. So only let them override if their address is not found. The other type of geocoder that we'd like to talk about is direct lookup. So I'm just going to put in a city or a state and I'm going to get a polygon back for the city boundaries of the state polygons. These are easy lookups, but it's still, in my opinion, considered a geocoder. I put these in a category of direct lookup. There are interesting things we can do with these polygons like, hey, who's your neighbor? Those types of scenarios. Those are pretty cool scenarios we can do with a direct lookup. The last geocoder that I'm going to talk about is a text processor. We rolled our own. We built a legal description processor that can handle some of the complex data that is in the public land survey system. We'll talk more about that in the demos. The other reason these geocoders are important are data migration. We heavily used these geocoders in data migration, as you'll learn about the system that we're working on. The migration data has to be geospatially enabled. So how do we do that? And it's also a living thing. The geocoders have to be evolving and continue to run on that data and they help our data from becoming stale. And at this point in time, I'd like to go ahead and introduce a client for this system, which is Byron Clayton at the Bureau of Land Management. Thank you, Lee. Hello, my name is Byron Clayton, and I am on the BLM Mineral and Land Records product team known as MLRS. I am one of the BLM leads that works closely with Accenture, including Lee's team, to develop MLRS for the Bureau since June 2019. I'm going to give a brief overview of MLRS and highlight what we are trying to accomplish over the three plus years of development. Our goal with MLRS is to modernize processes of tracking the nation's land and mineral case record information. You may be aware of our existing legacy systems such as LR2000 or Legacy Rehost 2000, which maintains the majority of the Bureau's land and mineral case information in a 30 plus year old tabular system. A similar BLM legacy system in Alaska called ALIS or the Alaska Land Information System is accomplishing the same tasks as LR2000 with some enhanced geospatial capabilities and better data validation tools. Our goal is to make one modernized system for the entire U.S. to replace the legacy systems, which also includes more interaction with the public through the MLRS. Here are the five major categories that we're focusing on. Obviously, the big one right, that we're talking about today is the geospatial capabilities. Being able to tie geospatial with our legacy case information um, that's more tabular in nature is really key to MLRS's success. Um, data validation is also huge. Um, we're trying to make sure that the data that's inputted into the system, either through the community or through the BLM internal user, has validation checks that can ensure better quality data. Um, we're also looking for streamlined adjudication through in um, standardized workflows that we can throughout the entire U.S. to maintain a, a better process moving forward. Um, workload management is another to be able to manage um, how the adjudicator is working with the files and how they interact with the community and, and 
Last but definitely not least is the community the customer self-service. By including the public in this equation, we have a couple things we need to consider, such as ensuring good quality data, especially with GIS, since the average public will not be GIS experts. Another major consideration is user experience, making it simple and intuitive and ultimately fast processing, um, with fast processing times. That is a real high level overview that highlights what we're going to accomplish and gives you an idea of some of our challenges to solve. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentation. I'm now handing this over to Brendan with Accenture to demo some of the functionality that we have been working on. Thanks, Byron. Hello, everyone. My name is Brendan Cannon. I'm a manager at Accenture and in my role on the MLS project, I support the BLM helping lead some of the development and test efforts for the application. Happy to be here with you today to show you some of the exciting things that MLRS has to offer. So let's get into it. For the demonstration today, I'm going to walk you through the end-to-end -end process for filing what is called a mining claim as a customer and adjudicating that claim as a BLM employee. I'll start in the role of a public user who is filing the mining claim, which means I've been out on the ground, I've put physical stakes in the ground and posted a notice that declares my intent to mine. And once I file the claim as a customer, I'll flip to the role of a BLM employee who will adjudicate the claim that I filed. As I go through the demonstration, I'll highlight some of the key areas of the application that Byron touched on, um, showcasing things like the geospatial capabilities of MLRS, uh, critical data validations, and workload management. So if you're looking at the screen here, I'm logged into the MLRS community as a public user, and you can see a personalized page with all my claims on the left and a menu of self-service options on the right. So I'll select the file a new claim from that menu, and that's going to launch a Salesforce flow that's going to walk me through the process of filing a new claim. So I'll select the claim type. I'll enter a claim name and select the date that I located it out on the ground. The next step in the process, I can add any claimants that I will be mining along with. So I'll add Byron and Lee Corporation and save and continue through the flow. And here's where we reach the plot claim step in the flow and sort of the core of the application where Salesforce interacts and integrates with Esri. And we have a geospatial component that provides me, the customer, the ability to derive accurate geospatial information uh, from the systems of record and then submit that clean data uh, as part of my claim. So again, I'll see a menu of options and I'll step through three processes. I'll show manual entry of claim information as well as using a GeoJSON file and state coordinates from GPS. So before I manually enter my claim information, I want to highlight quickly how we require certain fields to be populated by the customer before proceeding in the flow. So if I try to hit save and continue, I can see those fields are flagged for me. And as I proceed to fill them out, one thing we can highlight here is that the legal description processor that Lee touched on earlier, um, we've got data validations for how to manually enter this information. So if I enter incomplete, Township information that's not in the right format will flag that for the user. The same goes for our range and the other required fields. So when I enter that properly, those notifications go away. And if I hit save and continue here, this is where this text description of the claim information is being processed and generate any shape on the map. So we flag a notification to the user to review these changes. And I'll go back for the purposes of the demo. I see that I've updated land records. And if I actually open up the map, which I can do, say I want to upload a JS file, we can see that the shape that's actually generated um, by that legal description processor. So for the purposes of the demo, I'll move on to use a GIS, a GeoJSON file for my claim. So if I upload that file, I can select it and then save. And what that did was refresh this plot claim information. So I've updated acres and I've updated land records based off of uh, the context of that shape. And if I want to edit that, again, I can come in, I can clear, I can hide that file and I'll zoom out a little bit and now I've got let's say stake coordinates, I was out on the ground and I have the coordinates of the stakes of my claim and I'll use those 
as a customer and enter them and you can see we start to draw the shape or the lines of the shape and when I'm finished I'll finish the polygon and selecting use selects it and then I can save and again similar to the, the GeoJSON we derive updated land information for my claim the acreage uh, township brain section, quarter section, and the rest. So hopefully that demonstration helped highlight the geospatial capabilities of, of MLRS along with the data validations that drive some of those geospatial capabilities and the intuitive sort of self-service nature of the application. What I won't do is proceed through the flow here where the customer would require would upload required documentations and submit payment based on the acreage of their claim or the claimants on their claim. And what I'll do is I'll flip to the internal view of the application for the BLM employee. So in the interest of time and for the purposes of the demo, what we didn't show you was the file upload and payment portion of the community piece. So assuming that that all has happened now and the, and the claim has been filed by the customer, uh, it has gone to a queue on the internal side. So now I'm in the view of the BLM employee as an adjudicator. So it's gone to a queue. And it's been assigned to me uh, to adjudicate. I can see it here at the top of my list. So if I open up this case, what I see is a high-level overview of the, the filing that the customer submitted through the community. So I can see, again, the, the claim type, the data location, all the other required fields, and some of these that we've derived off of the information that the customer entered. I can see the file that they've uploaded. And then again, here on the related section, we can see the, the claimants that we had when we submitted the claim as well as uh, what we call the case land information, right? So again, that, that legal description um, gave us those. And then as well, if I wanted to as an adjudicator before I accept this claim and do all of the, take all the necessary steps to uh, process this filing from the customer, I could, I could reference the map um, the same way that the customer did through the community. Again, for the purposes of the demo, I won't do that. I'll go ahead and assume that I've done my job as an adjudicator and I'll click accept. In which case this notification goes out to the customer. This claim is now active and that concludes our demo. So hopefully, um, and with that, I'll hand it back over to Lee. Thanks. Thanks guys for the demo and the introduction. I really appreciate your help on this presentation. So let's talk about the Salesforce to GIS flow. Public user, as we saw, inputs the legal description, the legal land description. Salesforce then sends that legal description to a bunch of microservices running on a bunch of containers that can generate a polygon from a legal description. There's also other operations of calculating the core acres, calculating the acres per county, calculating the acres per state, acres per the surface management agency, and we also want to find all the intersected PLSS features so that we can calculate more about the legal description. Then, after that's all done, we commit the record and send the derived information off to Salesforce so that they can record that. But this all has to be done in a timely manner. We talked about keeping the users happy. This is that scenario. We have to do all this processing very quickly in a timely manner and return. So let's talk about what the pieces are for this. We got Salesforce, we have the Esri JavaScript API, and we have containers and ArcGIS Enterprise. So let's walk through the rest of the internals in a little more detail, but at a high level, we got those pieces, Salesforce, JavaScript, containers, and ArcGIS Enterprise. <clears throat> so let's talk about Salesforce and the web map. We had some limitations of embedding the JavaScript API into Lightning. Lightning has a ton of controls in it in Salesforce, and we had to figure out how to work around these things. So well, the first thing we do, we looked at Leaflet. Leaflet has a different loading process than the the JavaScript API from Esri. So we kind of toyed with using Leaflet. A lot of other projects use Leaflet. We chose not to. We chose to use an iframe, as simple as that may sound. And we'll talk more about that. But basically, Salesforce wraps an iframe that lets us access our data. So let's talk more about the Esri JavaScript API and React. We chose React. I know a lot of people use Angular for the mapping, but we chose React because it is very similar to Lightning. And if Lightning ever allows us to figure out how to embed JavaScript API, the Esri JavaScript API, then it makes that transition for us a whole lot easier. It also makes it easy for us just to use a simple container to host the web map within the application iframe. 
Talking from the iframe to Salesforce is really interesting. We figured out a system using post message to send messages back and forth. That lets us do a whole of the operations. So we say do stuff. Well, I'm not going to say exactly what the stuff is, but we do stuff. We calculate acres, we send data back and forth between Salesforce and JavaScript in an efficient manner just using post message. Let's talk about why we chose containers. Containers, well, scale. That's a big, big reason. So let's look at this process flow. We send the legal description and get the shape. We calculate the intersected acres against four feature services. We store one feature and its dependent records for internal users and processes. This takes one to two seconds per operation depending on the intersected count. Then, as a good friend of ours says, we let that barista get done and we let the next customer come in for the next service. So we get ready for the next user. The other reason we use containers is to handle the load that was prescribed. We need to run scale containers for this. Some of our instances require eight times scales. So we have eight processing workers to keep up with the load of the geoprocessing. This allows enough workers to handle the load and also give us huge outage resistance. We cannot be down when people are paying money to file a mining claim. We did encounter some pitfalls of the containers. The ArcObject SDK was not available for us in a simple container. Like if we're running Alpine Linux or Ubuntu, simple, simple containers, we really, really, really needed to be able to do fast year processing without having the full overhead of installing, say, RGIS server or the entire SDK. In fact, some cases it was not an option to install that stuff. Esri helps out here. <laughs> The uh, other thing that we had to figure out is what are some workarounds for this? So we figured out that we could use Anywhere ArcGIS to access the feature services. That library let us access the feature services directly and do different manipulations and easily translate the ArcGIS objects directly to the Net Topology Suite. So we use Net Topology Suite for a ton of our geoprocessing. There are other libraries and languages that can accomplish this as well. We are a .NET shop but you can use Python or anything else in these containers to do your processing. Uh, we also use GDAL and some other pieces to read files and do different things that way as well. For the moment, decoupling our microservices allows us to scale very easily in this manner. To talk about the ArcGIS Enterprise setup, it's, this is our no-brainer slide. We basically have the default install. Really nice thing about that is, is if we back it with a SQL Server, we can tune that really well for the load, and that's it. We chose this specifically for maintenance and being able to find people that can help us maintain this environment. With as much data as it has and as quickly as the databases are growing, there's a ton of maintenance operations that have to go on with this. So we chose the ArcGIS Enterprise stack and that way we can have tools like SOEs and SOIs and different pieces of the puzzle that you may not be able to utilize yet on ArcGIS Online. But ArcGIS Enterprise has given us a ton of power and it's easy for us to maintain and easy for us to find resources to help us maintain this piece. So I just want to kind of cover what we have going on here. We have the embedded map that's included in the iframe. We have the communication between the web map and microservices and Salesforce. And the one big thing that we learned through this whole process is load and setting expectations. Once we were able to define the expectations of the end customer, we were able to create heavy, heavy load scripts. And I'd like to give a shout out on the Accenture side. We have Rick over there who just beat this application up with his load testing through NeoLoad. And that really let us set expectations and figure out where we could scale the load for our containers. Making sure that we use Esri products in, our, in their default configurations really helps with the speed and maintenance for this. And the biggest thing that that helps with us too is using those SQL databases, those are all easy setups. We didn't have to do a ton of customization to be able to handle the scale that we need to. And I'd like to just end by, thanks for having us pres present today and be kind and work hard. Thank you.